So what I'll, what I'll do to you this morning um, is talk a little bit about my research program, but also how I got there. So starting from the beginning um, and sort of building up towards uh, uh, how I got to my own group and the type of research that we're doing. Um, and so my talk is called Dynamic Ubiquitin Signaling uh, Coordinates Transcriptional Reprogramming. And what that exactly means, we'll, we'll uh, find out in the next uh, few minutes. So first of all, um, how did I get here then? So I started uh, 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 my university degree in 1997. Um, and uh, I did that in the Netherlands, where I'm originally from. and. Um, in the Netherlands at the time, we had only integrated master's degrees. So uh, it's a combination of a bachelor's and a, and a master's degree at the time. Um, and I chose to study biology, um, particularly because I was very interested actually in evolutionary biology. Um, and uh, when, I, when I started doing that, actually in the first year or so, I discovered that um, while I was interested in that, I wasn't particularly interested in the methodology of, of evolutionary biology. And I really discovered in my first year my love for molecular plant sciences instead. Um, and so uh, um, towards the end of my study, um, I did a few internships. And um, in those internships, I really got to um, uh, study the plant immune system a little bit better. And um, that's really where my, my research career, I think, started. And so that was around uh, the year 2000, 2001 or so. And so um, what particularly interested me um, was that plants have all these different uh, types of attackers. They have insects, bacteria, fungi, viruses, nematodes, oomycetes, that all attack, attack the plants. And all these different attackers use very different strategies to attack plants. You know, some use uh, uh, ways, of course, to, to chew up the plants. Others try to invade, sneak in and, and, and not be detected. Others cause cell death. So how as a plant do you cope with all these different um, uh, types of, of attackers? And of course, the backdrop to that was really interested me was um, that I found out that there's, there's all these, uh, there's these tremendous crop losses um, that are due to biotic diseases. And so that's just illustrated in this graph here on the right, where you can see um, the average yield for some of the major crops in the world uh, listed in green, and the amount that is lost due to biotic disease in purple. And you can see that that loss ranges from around 10 to 40% or so. So that's really, really substantial. And of course, we know all that, that there's a growing population, and, and, and uh, one of the strategies to, to try to feed that population is to curb these crop losses. But perhaps more important so is the way we've been trying to um, uh, combat crop losses is by chemical prop crop protection. And so if we look at this um, uh, picture here, we can see that pesticide usage um, from 1990 here to 2011 um, has dramatically increased, as you can see by the dark green colors appearing. And if we look at that in a graph form on the bottom right here, you can see that the amount of herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and, and other chemicals have really dramatically increased. Now, chemical crop protection is not always bad, of course. In some cases, it can be very useful. Um, but in many cases, it's not a sustainable way um, to uh, combat diseases um, and, and harms the environment. And so these things really grab my attention um, during my integrated master's uh, degree, and I, and I wanted to study them. And in particularly, I started to study this um, in the lab of Cornet Pietersche in the Utrecht University. Um, I started to study the interaction uh, between different signaling pathways in the plant. And so biotrophic pathogens are biotrophic pathogens are pathogens that invade the plant cell, try to do it in a sneaky way, um, try to remain undetected, um, and thereby feed off of living cells. Macrotrophic plant pathogens um, are a little bit similar to insects in that way. They actually destroy cells first and then feed on the contents of those cells. So it's a, it's a, it's a less, less of a tactful strategy than biotropes, perhaps. And um, what plants do is that you use very different signaling pathways to defend themselves against these threats. So biotropes are defended through a pathway that involves the plant hormone salicylic acid. So that induces resistance against these biotropes. 
whereas nacotrophs in insects are broadly defended using the plant hormone jasmonic acid, another stress hormone, but also a developmental um, hormone. And that induces nacotroph insect resistance. Now, what had emerged around that time is that, interestingly, if you put a biotroph onto a plant, it does not just induce the salicylic acid signaling pathway, but some biotrophs also induce this jasmonic acid signaling pathway. And that was really intriguing. And it turns out that that's a strategy of biotrophs to infect. Um, and that's because these biotrophs purposefully create a mimic of the hormone jasmonic acid. And that uh, mimic actively inhibits the, the salicylic acid signaling pathway. And as a result, of course, there's less biotroph resistance uh, launched by the plant then, um, leading to, to uh, better infection by these biotrophic pathogens. So I was very interested in this. Um, you know, these, these pathogens using very clever strategies um, to infect the plants. But plants are not completely helpless, of course. Um, and what I discovered during my masters is that there's a protein downstream of salicylic acid known as MPR1. And MPR1 is a transcription factor um, or transcription cofactor, really, um, that induces biotroph resistance. But the other very important thing is that it does is that it inhibits jasmonic acid signaling. So despite these biotrophs activating this jasmonic acid pathway, um, they also activate inadvertently MPR1, which makes sure this jasmonic acid pathway stays down low and uh, uh, there is a prioritization of this biotroph resistance so that the plant remains resistant to these attackers. Now, so that, that, that all led to my um, integrated master's degree in, in 2002. Um, and then I decided to, uh, to do a PhD. And um, I really enjoyed standing in the lab, um, making hypotheses and, and, and really uh, uh, getting down to, to mechanistic explanations of what was happening in, in plant pathogen interactions. So really just submerging yourself into the unknown world, um, of, of, um, unknown natural world. Um, and at the same time, I was also in, more interested in finding um, solutions to the world's grand challenges, uh, one of which is um, uh, to feed a growing population in a sustainable way, um, and also to gain some more transferable skills. Um, and that could be you know, skills in management, research, um, in organization, networking, and teamwork, et cetera. All of these skills are, are, are things that you pick up during postgraduate research. Um, and of course, postgraduate research qualifications improve career prospects. It's not something I really thought about at the time, um, but it definitely is true um, looking at it in hindsight. Um, and uh, of course, you get great personal development from working in very diverse environments and um, research groups tend to be extremely diverse environments with people from um, all walks of life and people from all over the world, um, which is a very enriching um, experience. And so I decided actually to do my PhD um, at Duke University, which is in North Carolina in um, uh, the United States. Um, and one of the reasons I did that is because um, I had good connections with a group there um, collaborated with with them during my master's degree already and decided that that was the right place for me to to do a a, a, a degree in, 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 in a PhD degree. And so um, I was interested then in figuring out more about this pathway on the left here, how salicylic acid um, activates this MPR1 transcription cofactor and how that then leads to uh, a plant immune response. And so you're all very familiar with salicylic acid, I think. Um, it's used in uh, both healthcare and agriculture. You know salicylic acid, uh, particularly as acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin, which we use, of course, to treat all sorts of ailments. Um, similarly, um, in agriculture, salicylic acid analogs are used, um, such as this one over here, Bion, which you can spray onto the field. Um, and you can see here, this is a group of plants that has been sprayed with SA, and this is a group of plant that has not been. And those, of course, clearly succumb to, to pathogen attacks. So this salicylic acid analogs can really provide um, disease resistance in the field. Um, however, um, as with all medicine, there are side effects um, or trade-offs. And, and so indeed, if you apply too much of this chemical on the fields, it reduces yields because there's a trade-off between growth and defense. 
Um, it's constitutive and not inducible, meaning that um, if you apply it, it activates immunity, and that may not necessarily be exactly when you need that immune uh, system to kick in. So better alternatives are really needed. And so downstream of salicylic acid, as I said, is this is activator called MPR1. Um, and MPR1 is a master regulator of salicylic acid responsive genes. So if you apply salicylic acid to a wild type plant, um, then what happens is you get a dramatic reprogramming of uh, uh, the genome. Um, and you see lots of genes here in red that are being expressed. So every line in this graph here is a gene that is expressed over time and a lot of genes in green that are also being repressed. And we're talking about 2000 genes or so here out of the Arabidopsis genome of about 26,000 genes. Um, the MPR1 mutant, on the other hand, you can see, is completely blind to the presence of salicylic acid. So those genes that went off in the wild type stay on in an MPR1 mutant, and the genes that went on in the wild type stay off in an MPR1 mutant. And consequently, this mutant is highly susceptible um, to uh, different diseases by biotrophic pathogens. And so during my PhD, um, I looked at this protein and I was interested in its regulation. And one of the things I discovered um, is that MPR1 is a rather unstable protein. And so if you treat plants with salicylic acid, MPR1 goes into the nucleus, as you can see here, we, we fused it to uh, GFP fluorophore, and you can see the nuclei of plant cells light up. But if you then apply a protein synthesis inhibitor, and so new MPR1 cannot be synthesized, you can then follow what happens to the MPR1 that has already been synthesized, you see that it all disappears. Um, and uh, that turned out to be due to the fact that MPR1 is highly unstable and is degraded by the proteasome. Now, um, I'll give you a very quick 101 on uh, uh, how that degradation happens because it goes through ubiquitin signaling. And ubiquitin signaling requires different enzymes, particularly I'll focus here on the E3 enzyme. E3 enzymes take a ubiquitin molecule, add it to a substrate, either as a, a monomer or as a chain of polyubiquitin. <clears throat> and that can uh, 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 signal for substrates to be targeted to the proteasome. Now, how we normally think of, of the degradation of transcriptional activators, such as this hypothetical transcription activator here, is that you might have an E3 ligase that adds ubiquitin to it, um, and then that targets that transcriptional activator to the proteasome, the cellular trash bin, and thus that turns off transcription. And that is not the case for MPR1. And what I discovered during my PAC was rather extraordinary. And um, what I found is that um, salicylic acid responsive genes are normally in an off state upon uh, exposure to pathogen threat, salicylic acid accumulates, induces MPR1 to go into the nucleus which then arrives at these, these target genes, interacts with the transcription factor there, and activates defenses. However, I told you it's unstable. So what happens then? So what happens is that after MPR1 had activated defense, we thought that it seemed to go into some sort of spent state, in a state in which it was no longer able to activate further gene expression. So it could do it only a limited amount of time. Um, you then require a particular E3 ligase called CRL3 that adds that ubiquitin chain to MPR1, which recruits it to the proteasome um, and results in the degradation of MPR1. And that essentially resets the promoter into the off state, allowing a new MPR1 to come in and go through this cycle again. And so rather than an on off switch, you now have a dimmer effect of gene expression. So the rate of degradation of MPR1 begins to determine how much gene expression you get. And it turned out that this is a mechanism that is now uh, prevalently uh, recognized for other eukaryotic transcription factors, including many uh, human transcription factors that are, um, in some cases, oncogenes. It's quite an important mechanism um, that eukaryotes use. Now, beyond my PhD then, I made this discovery. Um, I decided then to uh, come to the University of Edinburgh, where I'm still, um, where I did a short postdoc um, using uh, fellowships from uh, EMBO, as well as a, a Dutch Rubicon uh, fellowship. And um, in 2010, I started my own research group 
And in 2019, or it was possibly 2020, I became Gatsby uh, Plant Science Advisor. Now, during this time of my postdoc and starting my own research group, um, we became more interested in ubiquitin. Um, and I really wanted to, to uncover uh, what this, this molecules can do. Um, and one of the interesting things about ubiquitin is that it contains all these different internal lysine residues. And these internal lysine residues um, can be used to attach the next ubiquitin to. And so there are seven internal lysine residues and the most N-terminal methionine. And so if you add ubiquitins to these different lysines and different linkage, the way, different ways in which you linkage them, you can see here um, from the, the cartoons here that um, when you have one ubiquitin in yellow and another ubiquitin in orange, you can see that um, depending on the linkage type that you use, you get a very different structural um, arrangement of these ubiquitins. And that results in very different signaling functions of these ubiquitin chains. Some are for proteasomal degradation, but others are for other signaling roles, such as DNA repair and, and uh, trafficking or, or other signaling functions. Now, um, what we do in my lab now is we use ubiquitin binding domains that can distinguish between these different uh, uh, chain types. Um, and um, we can then study what happens to these different chain types after we activate immunity. And in fact, what we see is that if you activate the immune system, different chain types begin to accumulate in the plant cell. You can then use that purified uh, uh, substrates that, that have these different chains, digest them, and that leaves a particular remnant profile, a so-called diglide profile, um, where you have a peptide from your substrate protein and a remnant of where it was ubiquitinated. So you can now not just identify substrates that carry the particular chain, you can also find out um, uh, uh, where exactly they were ubiquitinated. And so we can do that um, to uh, find out um, uh, the ubiquitin chain topologies that we find uh, that we see throughout the, the, the cell and what type of diverse cellular processes this regulates. Now, of course, you don't really need to read this, but I just want to show you that we can get all these networks of proteins and how they work and, and identify these particular cellular processes um, for total ubiquitin, but also for these different chain types. And I'll show you very quickly one way in which different ubiquitin topologies or linkage types can regulate transcription. And I'll just bring you back to MPR1 then, um, where we show that MPR1 can be first modified by this CRL3 ligase. Now we found out that actually that adds a K48 chain linkage to MPR1, and that's required for the activation of MPR1. So if we knock out this E3 ligase, we see that the activation potential of MPR1 goes down. We then discover that there's another enzyme, UBE4, um, which functions the opposite way. So if we knock it out, we get highly activated MPR1, as you can see in the graph here. And that's because UBE4 adds a K63 chain, uh, which is subsequently used as a platform for further K48 modification by this E3. And so we get this really complex chain topology of, of ubiquitin, um, which is being utilized to regulate the activity of MPR1. One other thing that we, what we then found um, is that beyond this substrate ubiquitination, Something also happens when MPR1 is uh, finally recruited to the proteasome. And so we, so we found that there's a substrate relay from these different E3 and so-called E4 ligases to another ligase that sits at the proteasome. And that I ligase, we expect, adds yet another chain to MPR1. And so there's this 11th hour uh, chain remodeling that takes place at the proteasome of MPR1 as well. And we're trying to understand you know, why the complexity of this chain needs to become even more complex, even though you've already arrived at the proteasome. And we think that that has something to do with the processivity of the proteasome. So keeping the proteasome as active as possible um, in, in degrading MPR1. Now, um, so what we do in my lab then uh, as, as a total, and what I've shown you briefly here is that um, we're looking at the diverse complex ubiquitin chain linkages plants use um, in, in its immune system, how these topologies regulate transcription activator activity, 
And that transcription activator essentially passed from one ubiquitin ligase to the next, almost like a relay mechanism um, where um, the baton is essentially the substrate. Um, and that there's this 11th hour ubiquitin chain remodeling that happens at the proteasome, which increases its processivity. Now, how can we use all this research? Is kind of fundamental research to control the chemical and genetic or to, to, to meet crop protection challenges. Well, so we can now use this knowledge to create chemical or genetic control strategies um, uh, to uh, boost immunity in plants. And so I've shown you MPR1, and we, for instance, know that overexpression of MPR1 induces defense, inducible defense responses in plants. Uh, we believe that we can stimulate the activity of this E3 ligase and in increase immunity. Uh, we already know that if we inhibit the activity of UBE4, we can boost immunity. We expect that if we alter this, the, the uh, activity of these ligases that are associated with the proteasome, that we can stimulate activity. And we also know that if we can stimulate activity of the proteasome itself, that we can uh, boost immunity. So taken together, um, we can have uh, a, a, a very precise way of trying to control plant immunity using different chemical and genetic control strategies. Now, I'll end there, and I'll just show you my uh, research group, um, uh, which is listed here as it is at the moment. Um, and of course, I should thank a lot of people that have come through the lab as well. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to answer questions on both the research, but also, of course, my career or anything else that uh, might come to mind for you.